Hey, hey, everybody, it's your girl, Planet Talk on Deck. I hope you guys are having a great day, afternoon, and or evening whenever you guys are seeing this. So you guys already know that I appreciate you guys being on deck, right? All right, that's what's up. So imagine being wrongfully convicted for a crime that you did not commit. Today, I'm going to be talking about the Clarence Lee Bradley case. If you want to know the ins and outs, the details, what really happened, all you got to do, stay tuned. All right, guys, so thank you so much for being back on deck. You guys already know I appreciate it. I'm going to be reading from some notes I made um, on my, my cue card um, folder here. So let's get into it. Clarence Lee Bradley was born on September the 24th, 1951. He was wrongfully convicted of a murder of a 16-year-old high school student named Cheryl D. Ferguson in 1981, just before his 30th birthday. So for the people at home, could you guys even imagine that? Um, Clarence was a high school custodian supervisor at Conroe High School in Conroe, Texas, while Ferguson was a student athlete visiting the school from Bellevue, Texas. On the day of Cheryl's murder, three Caucasian custodians claimed they saw Cheryl enter a girl's restroom near the gymnasium and shortly after saw Bradley walking towards the restroom with a armload of toilet paper. The men claimed they told Bradley there was a girl in the restroom, and he replied he was taking the toilet paper to the boys' restroom. The men allege they did not see Bradley again until about 45 minutes later, after a search had begun for the missing student. Now, right here, one of the things that caught my attention was if it's three other guys, and they know that there's a girl, a young girl who's in the bathroom over there, um, in a restroom that somebody is going to and they know that there's a young girl in the restroom that this uh, that this other custodian is going to why wouldn't they try to stop them anybody ever question that after all it's three other custodians remember Bradley was the supervisor or a supervisor not necessarily theirs but he was a custodian supervisor no one thought it strange that the three men who saw him going to the bathroom with the armful of toilet paper, aside of just saying there's a young girl in the restroom, no one thought it strange that they, some one of the guys didn't, you know, take a stance and like, hey, dude, don't go in there, okay? Wait for her to come out. Even if he said, I'm going to the other rest, to the boys' restroom, nobody followed him to see. Let's get back in the story. A fourth Caucasian custodian named Peace, this was his last name, added that Bradley was insistent on immediately searching the loft where Cheryl's body was found. So a search ensued after about 45 minutes. One of the teachers presumably recognized that the young girl was missing and they said, well, where's Cheryl? Everybody, let's search for her. Allegedly, Bradley said, oh, let's go look under this loft over here. And that's where Cheryl's body was found. Light up the comments and let me know if you guys have ever heard of this story. August the 28th, 1980, five days after the crime, Bradley professed innocence before an all-white Montgomery County Grand Jury. Now, some of you may wonder, well, why, would, why is it important that the jury was all-white? Why is it important that that part has to be stated in the story? Well, here's a fun fact. Not only was all the jury all-white, so was all the other custodians who were co-workers slash witnesses so was the deputy so was the da so was all the police everybody involved aside of bradley um, were actually white let's finish the story although bradley can although bradley contradicted his white co-workers in several respects he acknowledged he had disappeared for about 30 minutes around the time the murder was believed to have occurred. Bradley stated he was in the custodian's office smoking and listening to music alone. Bradley further testified that a number of other persons had master keys that would open the auditorium. Now, here's a fun fact for you guys. I have family members who are custodians. I, I know, I've known several people throughout my life to actually be custodians. It is very true and very probable that multiple people can have master keys to get in the exact same room. If you guys 
have ever known someone who is a custodian or if you are a custodian, light up the comments and weigh in. Is that true for you? In December 1980, Bradley went on trial for a case that was based entirely on circumstantial evidence and witness statements. There was no physical evidence leaking Bradley to the crime. Pubic hair with so-called negroid characteristics were allegedly found on the body and were subsequently lost from the prosecution's exhibits and have never been removed and have never, I'm sorry, and have never been recovered. There was also sperm removed from Cheryl's body that had been destroyed without ever being tested. And lastly, a fresh blood spot had been found on the victim's blouse. The blood did not come from the victim and did not match Bradley's blood. The spot was type A. Bradley's had type O. One juror found the evidence insufficient to establish guilt, forcing Judge Sam Robertson Jr. to declare a mistrial. The name of the juror, William Shurek, soon became public knowledge, leading to anonymous harassment and him being called racial slurs like an in lover. Okay. He was also followed, it was, he, he received threats, and he also um, received threats of bodily harm because. This juror said, hmm, something ain't right. This is not adding up. Do you guys think at home that you could be brave enough that if you were a juror, if you felt that something was not sitting right with you, do you think you could be brave enough to speak up on it? Light up the comments and let me know. On the day of Bradley's arrest, a Texas Ranger named Wesley Stiles looked him in the face and said, one of you is going to hang for this. Since you're the end, you're elected. Now, there were two custodians that he was speaking to. One of them were, was Caucasian, and there was Bradley, who happened to be African-American. So he, the Texas Ranger, Wesley Stiles, he didn't know who did it. And when Bradley was initially in, um, spoken to, interrogated, should I say, there was never an interest of looking for the justice of who actually killed Cheryl. It was just a matter of, this happened, somebody has to pay for it. And guess what? Because you're black, it's gonna be you. After the first trial, when Bradley was found guilty and sentenced to the death penalty, John Sessom, former custodian who previously testified against Bradley, said he saw former co-worker and friend, Aceman, follow Cheryl up a staircase leading to the auditorium and then heard her scream, no! and don't. Later that day, Aceman warned Sessman not to tell anyone. Although it was noted that Caucasian pubic hair was found on the victim as well, no action was taken to prove where it had come from. Now, if you guys have been following this story, so they got two custodians, one Caucasian, one African-American, the guy Bradley is the main character in this story, the African-American guy, right? The Texas Ranger Wesley automatically said, somebody's got to hang, it's going to be you. When they examined Cheryl's body, what happened at that point? They examined Cheryl's body, they allegedly found a pubic hair that, that had um, African-American characteristics. Yet mysteriously, it was lost. Not in evidence, no one ever tested it. They also found a, a pubic hair that was from, that had Caucasian characteristics. However, mysteriously, that pubic hair came up missing too. So one of the questions I have, and some of the people at home may have is, was there ever really any evidence? And if there was, how mysteriously did both of the, the all of the evidence rather come up missing? What happened to it? So a woman by the name of Brenda Medina, she's the former girlfriend to a, a custodian named James Decker Robinson. He happened to be one of the four white custodians who worked at the school during the time that Cheryl came up raped and murdered right? She said that Robertson confessed to her that he killed someone at Conroe High School while working as a custodian. <clears throat> Medina said she did not believe him at the time until she saw the news. At her neighbor's suggestion, she got an attorney to talk to the district attorney, yet they did not believe her to be a credible to be a credible witness. So Medina's lawyer went to talk to Bradley's lawyer directly to tell of their findings. 
So now we have an ex-girlfriend to one of the custodians who was there say that her ex-boyfriend confessed and told her that he killed a young lady at Canoe High School. The same, around the same time that Cheryl uh, wound up raped and dead. After further investigation, Bradley's lawyers petitioned for another evidentiary hearing, which was granted on June 30th, 1987. Robinson admitted that he told Medina he had killed Cheryl, but he said it was only to scare her so she stopped, pe pe so she stopped pressing him to have a baby. When Texas Ranger Styles was pressed about why he did not, why he had not obtained a hair sample from Aikman to compare with the Caucasian pubic hair and others found on the victim. Now keep in mind, Aikman is the other Caucasian custodian who was present at the time that Cheryl was killed. Styles said, let's just say I didn't do it and it wasn't done. And why it wasn't done, I don't know. Interesting. On October 9th, 1987, Jude Pickett recommended that the Court of Criminal Appeals grant Bradley a new trial. The Court of Criminal Appeals sat on the case for 14 months before finally accepting Pickett's recommendation. On December 13th, 1989, the prosecution appealed, appealed delayed the case another 10 months. So what we're talking about now is the Court of Criminal Appeals, they were to grant Brantley, Bradley a new trial based on the evidence or the circle, based on the fact that Medina, the ex-girlfriend to one of the custodians came forth and said there was a confession, right? So they said, okay, something's not seeming right. Let's grant, let's grant this guy Bradley a new trial. Now, the Court of Criminal Appeals, they waited 14 whole months before they took that recommendation and would take any action. Now, after that 14 whole months had passed, here's the timeline. December 13th, 1989, the prosecution who, orig who originally put Bradley in jail, they went ahead and they appealed the decision so that he had to stay in jail an additional 10 months. An additional 10 months. Now, can you guys imagine, even just for a moment or a split second, how you would feel if after so much time you had already been in jail keep in mind bradley his entire sentence he was on death well he was on death row for 10 years of his sentence right so this is equivalent to every day waking up not knowing if it's going to be your last day to be alive and breathing and this is all based on so circumstantial evidence let's get back into the story finally on october 1st 1990 Texas first versus Bradley, they dropped all charges. A few months later, Bradley was an ordained minister. A few months later, Bradley was an ordained, was ordained as a Baptist minister. And a few months after that, he was married. Officials involved in the case never apologized and were not disciplined. A movie was later created about Bradley's life starring award-winning actor Courtney B. Vance and Lamont Walker called Whitewash. Bradley was never compensated by the state of Texas for his grave miscarriage of justice. September the 2nd, 2018, Bradley passed away at a medical facility from pneumonia. All right, guys, thank you so much for rocking with me for this story time. I know it's a little different than the stories I, I usually will talk about, but true, true crime really does interest me, um, and I am looking to put out more content like this. You guys let up the comments and let me know if you guys are rocking with rocking with me or not, if you guys like it. If you guys would like to sponsor this story time or any other story time, you guys can do so by dancing on over to Cash App, put in dollar sign, your favorite besties, uh, and let me know that you guys will let, like me to keep creating this type of content for you. Okay, um, I thank you guys so much for being on deck. I really do. Like I always say, there's always another story to be told, but for now, bye. Oh, and I'm so sorry, I forgot to say this. Light and love to the family of Clarence Lee Bradley um, and all the people who he loved, knew, and touched. Light and love to the family of the deceased, Cheryl Ferguson. I'm so sorry that you had to experience that and you had to go so young. You had your whole life ahead of you. Really sorry. Light and love to you and your family as well.